right, move them people out over there. Spread them out. Watch that train in front of you. Watch that train in front of you. Hey, I want all the people to the first train. Keep pushing right there. Move. Among the vital environmental problems facing our planet, none is more severe than the destruction of the food producing countryside by chemical and industrial pollution. Forcing traditional farmers off the land and into the cities has become a major political and economic fact of life. But in all of human history, the American intervention in Vietnam unleashed the largest and most prolonged attempt to consciously destroy an agricultural ecology and rural-based culture. Where are we going now? Uh, we are going to Hoi Son and maybe Son Son if we can reach there. What province? Uh, this is uh, Miko province. This film consists of scenes taken by myself on five trips to Indochina beginning in 1969 and ending in 1973. We traveled to Indochina to study and document the techniques and effects of this war on the environment. When the United States moved into Indochina in force in the early 1960s, it encountered a situation which was unusual in terms of conventional warfare. This was essentially a counterinsurgency operation, and given the geographic, topographic, and ecological features of Indochina, it soon became apparent that the environment, the forests, and the fields were one of the main problems facing the United States military. The forests gave cover and sanctuary, while the farmlands gave food to the troops of the other side. Among other tactics, this assault included the massive use of chemical warfare. It has been said that guerrillas fighting in their country's liberation are like fish in the ocean, the ocean being the land and the peasantry that support them. The American strategy of ecocide was an attempt to dry up this ocean, the environment. At 8.15, we took off in a Huey helicopter with Captain Maximowicz, commander of the 48th Chemical Detachment. We flew up a number of valleys that had been sprayed with Agent Blue for crop destruction. We saw several areas burn, probably, uh, fire started during the dry season by white phosphorus uh, artillery. One must take into account the cultural upset that occurred as a result of this strategy. People whose ancestors had lived close to the land for centuries and whose cultures and traditions were built around a closeness to nature were forced to buy their basic needs in stores and depend upon money. Churches built by the French came under incessant bombing and artillery attacks, as did dams, bridges, and irrigation reservoirs. Hamlets and houses were fought over, and families uprooted and ripped apart. As much as a third of the total population of Laos, Cambodia, and South Vietnam were forced out of the countryside and into either refugee camps, so-called prosperity hamlets, or cities. 
Saigon mushroomed from a population of roughly 700,000 to nearly 4 million, a process American planners dubbed forced urbanization. I'm recording this at the corner of the Central Square in Saigon. This is not the mush hour either. Mày hầu đó mấy ông nó chúc người em đổ ngay máy bay chúc người em đổ chở yeah. máy bay chở máy bay anh đổ đây. Uh, six or seven years ago, they used the airplane to uh, bring us and drop us here. The bombing is so bad that all make of hole, and uh, she's afraid that even there's no place to build a house on it. Oh, there's rockets and bomb and everything. Trời ơi, bom 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 gì mà bỏ cái cũng nó ầm 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 cái cũng nó lỗ. She likes to go back to her home village because here there is no land and there is no place to grow even the vegetables. No rice growing at all. Until the American intervention in Vietnam, the peasants of both North and South were almost entirely subsistence farmers. Like the native peoples who lived in the Americas before the white settlers came, most Southeast Asian families grew nearly all the food they consumed. The principal crop was rice, supplemented by other grains and a wide variety of vegetables and fruits. For protein, many Indo-Chinese relied on fish caught in coastal waters and in the lakes, streams, and ponds that abound throughout Indochina. They are also great consumers of poultry and raise large numbers of ducks and other fowl. These pools are not bomb craters. Ponds created by hand to raise fish have been used for centuries. The Vietnamese countryside was also an important producer of rubber. Thousands of acres of tropical and subtropical land were devoted to plantations of the lush trees which were tapped for latex sap, the raw ingredient of rubber. One principal tool in the American assault was conventional explosives dropped from high-flying B-52 bombers and other aircraft. All types of habitat were bombed from the paddy fields of the Mekong Delta to the cooler, mountainous regions of the Central Highlands. Forests, mountain slopes, fields, all were riddled with craters. Each B-52 carried up to 108 500-pound bombs. We have calculated that in 1968 alone, B-52s created 2.8 million craters. By the end of the war, some 20 million craters were bombed into the soil of South Vietnam alone. In the Delta region, the bombs often penetrated the water table. When they exploded, they left craters roughly 30 to 50 feet across and 5 to 15 feet deep, which then permanently filled with water. These holes provided a perfect breeding spot for disease-bearing mosquitoes and contributed to the serious wartime problems of hemorrhagic fever and malaria. This man has been moved uh, from An Thanh um, uh, nearby the Saigon River. Ở hồi ở An Thanh bác làm nghề chi ạ? Mần ruộng sống. When he is in An Thanh, he worked in the rice field. Why did he have to move? Uh, tại place? sao uh, ta không ở bên ngoài luôn? Lúc Mỹ vô. Uh, because the army can um, gather them here. Đời sống của bác uh, hồi từ lúc trước khi mà người Mỹ. Uh, the bombing uh, has burned up all his uh, homes, uh, the house. The whole of the bomb will des destroy the rice field and transform it into um, pools. When flying over Vietnam, 
one can observe that the water in many of these craters is of differing colors. Some are aquamarine, some green, some blue, some brown, some clear. This indicates differing chemical conditions in the water, possibly due to the different explosives used. But the colors themselves are thought to result from blue-green algae growing in the craters. In addition to the 500-pound bombs, the Air Force also used 2,000 and 3,000-pound bombs to deliberately make huge craters. This particular crater was made near Dong Hoi, probably to disrupt road traffic. Because of the difficulty of plowing around them and their impact on the soil and water, craters crippled farming in many areas. In general, when the bombs hit, they turned up the subsoil and spread it out over the topsoil. This subsoil, when exposed to the rains and sun, has a chemistry quite different from the original topsoil. One of the most awesome weapons of the war was the so-called daisy cutter bomb. Developed by the 7th Air Force, it is officially called the BLU-82B all-purpose high concussion bomb. It weighs 15,000 pounds, seven and one half tons. And short of nuclear weapons, it was the single most destructive bomb in the Defense Department arsenal. It is detonated by a three-foot probe which sticks out from the nose of the bomb. When dropped by parachute from an aircraft, it drifts slowly downward. When the probe strikes the ground, it detonates the bomb and makes a very powerful radial blast, but it creates no crater. Instead, when dropped in a triple canopy jungle, this device blows away almost all the vegetation from an area roughly the size of a football field. Colonel Gray called the big bomb an explosive bulldozer. The colonel stated, quotes, that trees are a bitch uh, to deal with. It is difficult to develop landing zones in these forests. Captain Neptune said that the big bombs have been used to create landing zones for helicopters, and that they have also been used for suspected troop concentrations. The effects of the bombing on the Vietnamese forests were devastating. Prior to the war, these forests contained many valuable hardwood trees, tall, sturdy hardwood trees such as teak. And Vietnam was completely self-sufficient in lumber. But American bombing and spraying destroyed more than 2,000 square miles of the usable forests in Vietnam and severely damaged 20,000 square miles, or 40% of the total enough to supply the country's needs for 30 years. During the war, visits to sawmill operations, especially in central Vietnam, often included the site of pile after pile of logs cast aside by mill operators, along with stacks of damaged saws. These logs were discarded because they had been hit by some type of metal, either a bullet or a fragment from a mortar or a bomb. Many of the trees died where they stood. In the humid Indochina atmosphere, shrapnel wounds in trees are as susceptible to infection as in human and animal flesh. Fungal growth led to the creation of necrotic areas, areas that have died in these trees. Often the entire tree would finally succumb. The metal fragments in those logs that were salvaged were very hard on sawmill operations. As the saws hit the metal, the saw teeth were ripped out, forcing the shutdown of the entire operation and the costly, time-consuming job of installing a new saw blade. The most thorough destruction of the Vietnamese forest may have been accomplished by the Rome Plow Program. Specially designed D7 Caterpillar tractors went into the jungle with plow blades developed in Rome, Georgia. The blades skimmed just above the surface of the forests, knocking down and then plowing up any vegetation in the way. This extraordinary machine could fell a tree up to one foot in diameter. There were 30 such caterpillars per land clearing company. 
and at the peak of their youth, five such companies operated for 15 hours a day, day in and day out. By the end of the war, 12,000 square miles, an area the size of Rhode Island, had been completely denuded of vegetation by these giant machines. On Tuesday, the 10th of August, we went out with the 984th Engineer Company land clearing outfit. They've been in the Boiloy Woods for 26 days. Uh, they've cleared 6,037 acres so far. They've got the 11th Cavalry of tanks blocking for them. They've had seven wounded in action, five seriously. They've disclosed over 100 bunkers. One of the bulldozers has 14 tons of added armor. The Hobo Woods are no longer there. They have been rolled plowed out of existence. It was 9,000 acres. The area had been defoliated some years ago and had been very heavily bombed. The land that has been Rome plowed has not returned to its original state. Much of it has been overrun by swordgrass, genus imperata, a tough weed that makes the land difficult to use for grazing, farming, or the planting of trees. The weapon with the longest term and most severe effects on both land and people was the wide variety of powerful chemical herbicides. Beginning in 1961, about 60,000 tons of chemicals, such as 245T and 24D, picloram, cacodylic acid, and others were dropped by American forces. This represented seven pounds of chemicals for every man, woman, and child in South Vietnam. Herbicides were sprayed by large cargo aircraft, by smaller planes, by helicopters, personnel carriers, river boats, and by troops carrying backpacks. Many peasants and American soldiers alike who were exposed to these chemicals later experienced symptoms including nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, and prolonged weakness. Combined with the bombing and plowing, Repeated chemical defoliation left an area of dead and rotting trees equal in size to the state of Connecticut. Half a million acres of mangroves alone were destroyed. The chemicals, which the peasants called medicine from the sky, took a heavy toll on the foods which have supported the people of Indochina for centuries. The papaya and manioc, their rice and other grains, their great number of vegetables and fruits, such as tangerines, pineapples, and jackfruit, all proved very sensitive to chemical attack. Many fish were killed, not so much from exposure to the chemicals, but by alterations in their habitat caused by the spray. The Vietnamese government now claims some two million people were directly victimized by American herbicidal warfare. The health effects suffered by many of them bear a strong resemblance to those symptoms now appearing in American veterans who were exposed to the chemical dioxin, one of the most poisonous chemicals known. Quantities measured in parts per trillion can cause a wide variety of problems, ranging from chloracne to cancer to birth defects and reproductive malfunction. The Agent Orange dropped on Vietnam contained more than 330 pounds of this poison. Ultimately, the saturation bombing, plowing, and defoliation did destroy much of the peasant base in Vietnam. But it did not stop the guerrilla forces that swam in that increasingly polluted sea. In 1975, the people against which the American military had directed so much manpower and technology drove the last US troops out of the country. Today, the program of ecocide continues to exact its price on the people and land of Vietnam. In the farmlands, several thousand craters have been filled to help reclaim prime growing areas. But millions of craters remain, as do thousands of square miles of sword grass or scrubby bamboo. In the countryside, revival of the rubber and mangrove forests is proceeding, but slowly. It now appears that after their death by herbicide, 
the most desirable of the mangrove varieties have not naturally reseeded. The Vietnamese have manually replanted some 15,000 acres of mangrove. This area contrasts with some 400,000 acres sprayed and destroyed during the war. Mangroves take some 30 to 50 years to reach maturity. Unexploded bombs also still present a lethal hazard. These are unexploded mortar bombs near Quang Tri City, six months after the end of the war. Nearly every village in the nation now maintains a special bomb defusing and removal squad. They're working on the land and they find the old M79 bomb that explodes and there's many accidents people killed that kill people around here. This is from old bombs that were... The old bomb M79. Yes. Although the capital city has become a much more healthy place since the war, its population is still more than four times its pre-war size. In the hospitals, disturbing symptoms have begun to surface among many of those exposed to the defoliants. The Vietnamese medical capability for dealing with these diseases is limited by scarce resources and help from other countries has been minimal. But the country's scientists are making a persistent effort to study cases of liver damage, birth anomalies, and cancer that have been linked to the herbicides. The noted Dr. Tan Tak Tung has asked, in the abominable history of wars, have we ever seen such an inhuman fate reserved for the survivors, except in the case of atomic war? The American strategies of ecocide and forced urbanization in Indochina throw a unique focus on a global pattern. Economic and political forces are combining with the spread of chemical and industrial toxins to force peasants off their land throughout much of Asia, Africa, and Latin America.